Outcome 2.2.3 is understand the principles of levers. Levers are devices that from the earliest of time man has used in order to use a mechanical advantage to move objects of a much greater weight than they could normally lift with their physical strength alone. There is a trade back for that though because nothing is gained from the standpoint of manufacturing the power or the work that's being done. So whatever is put in on one side obviously has to equal the work out on the other side or the energy out on the other side. So what happens if I can lift something of a greater load or weight, I sacrifice because then I can only lift it a smaller amount because of the trade-off. That's illustrated in this equation 2.13 showing that the Force 1 times the L1, or length 1, which is in this case that's defined as the applied force, times the applied force distance to the fulcrum, and those units can be in either inches or feet, and of course forces in pounds, is equal to the force of the load times the load distance to the fulcrum. As I said before, then this is an equalization of one side is equal to the other. Whatever I do to one side must be repeated to the other side. This illustration here shows that we define levers in three classifications. There is what is known as a first class lever, and in this case, you can see quite simply from the equation that we just had, the applied force, or F1, times this distance to the fulcrum point, which is our pivot point, must equal then the distance from the pivot point from the load and the load value in order this to be balanced. If I push down here with more force, then the load will go up. Right now, the, as you can see by the drawing here, that the distances are equal, so there is no mechanical advantage. This would be a one-to-one -one ratio for a mechanical advantage. Then we also have what is known as a second-class lever, which is sometimes given a nickname of the wheelbarrow uh, class of lever because of the nature of the operation of it, such that my fulcrum is out at this point, and then my load is at some point between the fulcrum point and the applied force, or F sub 1. Again, it's a summation of forces and efforts. So F1 times the distance L1 to the fulcrum point must equal the distance from the fulcrum point to the load, which is F sub 2. As you can see from the analogy here, why it is nicknamed the wheelbarrow effect which is exactly what you do with a wheelbarrow as you apply a second class lever. The last class is known as the third class, obviously. And again, we have a fulcrum point. And the difference is here, though, is that we are moving the applied force through a different distance or a different lo location, if you would, than the load is coming. So at this point, my load is at the extreme end of the, from the fulcrum point times that distance must again equal the distance from the L sub 1 distance to the fulcrum point from the applied force. What happens then is that it requires then a lot more force to lift a load, but the trade-off is that it will move a great distance up compared to the distance that I apply that force at F sub 1. Our review question that sees if we can understand and utilize that information is such that in the graphic shown L sub 1 is equal to 2 meters and L sub 2 is equal to 0.5 meters. Given the load of 45 kilonewtons, what pressure would be required to hold the load will a cylinder having a 100 millimeter bore? Well force, first of all I have to determine what that load the cylinder must exert and that's again here. So we're showing in the example here that this is in fact a third class lever. So the force here will be quite a bit more than the load, which is a good point to remember when you're checking your work. Make sure you've got the correct answer. But my load here is 45 kilonewtons. My distance is 2 meters. 
This distance is 0.5 meters, so F1 times L1 must equal L2 times F2. And if I do the math then, then I will see that F sub 2 is a factor of 4. So it takes four times the force at this point compared to the load value. So at that point, now I can calculate what my total force is for F sub 2, which is four times 45 kilonewtons. That then times, looking at the area of the 100 millimeter bore, calculating that area, and dividing that into that force component that we just calculated will give me the pressure that is required. 22.92 megapascals. This is how we use to determine that force. As I said, we look at the F sub 1 times L sub 1 divided by L sub 2 to get F sub 2. Putting those numbers in place and we come out with that the total force requirement there is 180 kilonewtons. Again, a factor of four, as I said before. Then we solve for the area of the piston. It's 100 millimeter bore. So our area is 7,854 square millimeters. Again, force divided by area is a pressure. It's Pascal's law. And so we have that 180,000 newtons divided by 7,854 square millimeters and our answer then is 22.92 megapascals.